this knot makes only an alphabet, but also a little scale. And this is how it sounds. This is the G, green function in the bass. Thank you. So this is work done uh, by master students, Mandy Hahnemann and Gino Wegner. And um, so they did a good job. And I will report a few of their results. Uh, so uh, this sketch here, if you re realize this red line, uh, it's symbolic for something that happens at the surface. And it changes things in terms of reflectivity of electromagnetic waves. So we are often familiar with discussing epsilon dielectric functions or conductivities. And uh, so actually, if you want to model what happens here, sometimes you need additional parameters. And this is, in a sense, what these additional boundary conditions are about. This is a calculation from uh, Mandy's work. And uh, the uh, presentation is a bit complicated. I will come to it in more detail uh, when we, I show this plot again. It's a comparison between uh, what is measured, data points, and theoretical calculations, including, for example, here the Druga model. And so there's a difference between the two. And we try to understand how this difference can be uh, explained or understood in a better way. And here's some plot of entanglement versus some, uh, so the concept of entanglement, it, I think it's kind of new to this meeting, a new topic. So I'll go through the basics. And uh, um, if you want to need more information, maybe Gabriele is a good uh, uh, docking point to ask for more. Yes. OK, does it work? Yes. So here's the outline again. Uh, so we are going to uh, ask the question, uh, did uh, somebody like uh, Lifshitz or uh, Casimir were aware that uh, these uh, Casimir forces, dispersion interactions, arise due to electromagnetic fluctuations and reflection of these fields? And uh, uh, so there's a, uh, if you talk about surfaces, we can make a distinction between simple surfaces that are well-defined boundaries and composite or complex surfaces that behave in a different way. Additional boundary conditions are a way to get around, uh, um, um, uh, let's say, a microscopic description uh, to, to, so to link what happens in a simple way in the bulk to, uh, to get to reflection problems. And uh, in particular, in the 80s, uh, in, in the context of media that have also polaritron excitations, this has been discussed a lot. So I'm a bit humbled by all the Latin American experts in the audience. Halevi uh, and uh, others in, in that region of the, of the world made a lot of uh, contributions, and uh, a few workers are here. Um, and this paper here by Henneberger, at the end of his career, he tried to uh, ask the question, was all this ABC discussion a kind of mistake and be something uh, fundamentally min misunderstood there? Uh, but this was from 98, and uh, the discussion still continues. So the concept is still useful and being used. So probably Henneberger himself made a mistake. And then about entanglement, um, uh, in terms of uh, this community where we deal with quantum fields and quantum fluctuations, maybe entanglement is maybe not in the right way of, uh, maybe just another way of telling the same story from a different viewpoint. Uh, and I will give you two examples uh, uh, where this uh, entanglement has to be quantified. And uh, maybe there's even a different turn uh, to this problem uh, to say, um, how can you measure entanglement? It's not a trivial issue. And maybe dispersion interactions are actually a way to measure it. Now, it's, it's just a way of reinterpreting what we are doing since 25 years uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the horizon of this new concept related to uh, quantum and quantum technology. OK, so let's jump into the first problem. Did Lifshitz know that he was writing down reflection amplitudes? Here's an example of his formula. So the Casimir force per area is this uh, integration here over two variables, a momentum and the frequency variable. And uh, if you look at these denominators and you had your optics lectures still here in your mind, you recognize here the inverse of the Fresnel coefficient for the TM polarization or the p-polarization. So here's the notation. S is the wave vector in the medium, dependent on the dielectric function. And p is the wave vector on the vacuum side. And so this combination 
if you are, have an optics education, you recognize that's the reflection coefficient. Lifshitz never says explicitly that these are, th these are the things he's manipulating, but uh, on the way where he's computing these things, he's talking about a wave that is reflected, but it's in quotes. So we don't really know whether he took that serious or not. Um, so I mean, cannot no longer ask him. So that's 55. Uh, if you go back to Casimir, of course, you remember that argument, uh, your plates, our plates, will become transparent in the UV, and that provides a natural physical cutoff for any kind of vacuum effects. And that has the idea that, okay, there is some reflectivity that depends on frequency. Uh, but it's not very explicit in his calculation. It's just a way of hand-waving, cutting off some integration. Agarwal 1575 explicitly wrote formulas for dispersion interactions in terms of classical green functions. And these green functions are computed based on boundary conditions and reflection applications. Wiley and Seid did a similar approach. And I found here papers from the 90s. And uh, actually, the, the first uh, uh, reference that came to my mind from my personal database was from uh, Giuseppe Bimonte, because it's in the title. Casimir interactions expressed in terms of boundary conditions. But uh, he was not the first. He just rediscovered uh, what people have more or less known uh, before. OK, so let's uh, go to a first example where these boundaries are a kind of decorated, complex, um, more interesting. And here's a first table where these reflection coefficients are again written down here. So this is the local version. I call it local because you have the simplest approximation for the fields inside the medium just by the dielectric function. And uh, if you go to the first line here, that's the TE polarization, all the three expressions are the same. So we have here different models, but they only make uh, a difference for the other polarization, the TM one. And uh, so uh, it's kind of disappointing. You, know, so you play with something with different media or uh, surface descriptions, and this kind of guy here is immune. Um, OK, but that, that's what you observe here by, just by doing the calculation. So here's an example. Uh, the CL model is a, is a surface charge that is located directly at the surface. And it is responding if there's a gradient in the surface charge by a diffusion term. So there's a current here that is proportional to the gradient of the surface charge. And then there's a continuity equation that links the surface charge to the bulk charge. Uh, and that, in the end, gives you with this parameter epsilon s this expression here for the TM polarization. So it looks ex extremely simple, similar to the uh, version by Fresnel, but this epsilon s is just different. It also contains this surface parameter ds. OK, so here's an example. Uh, if you want to visualize what you find here, this is the Green's function. It's imaginary value. So I heard Igor discussing that that's related to, uh, for example, spontaneous emission or the local density of states of the electromagnetic field. And here you see that this local density of states oscillates as a function of distance. This is uh, on the log scale, it looks weird, but on the linear scale it would be oscillations at uh, essentially half the wavelength. So there's a partial reflection from the boundary here. And uh, these length scales lambda and LD are the two numbers that you can find out of this model. LD is a length scale related to diffusion of charges. Um, here, so here are some formulas. What we worked out here in this paper uh, 10 years ago is the casimir polder interaction. So you have a single atom with a polarizability alpha that depends on uh, indices, but we took the simplest case where it's isotropic. It depends on frequency. And here, the electromagnetic part comes in via this green tensor here, expressions here as a function of integration. And uh, I apologize for the notation that is not homogeneous. Even across my own papers, we always change uh, letters for uh, these things. So V0 here would be the k vector in, in, on the vacuum side, written uh, as a decay constant. OK, so this is an example of what comes out when you do uh, this formula. And uh, I would like to discuss a bit these curves because they correspond to a discussion that has been given uh, 10 years ago, even before. Uh, Peter Yevsky, for example, uh, partic participated as well um, into the problem, what is the value of the free energy? It's a finite temperature calculation, so that's the correct thermodynamic uh, variable that you need, uh, of uh, 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 an atom at a large distance. So I was missing here the factor 1 over z to the cube. So this is missing here. Sorry for that. Uh, this is because we multiply when we make this plot here, this free energy with z to the cube to get something which is easier to read and to plot. 
And so uh, if you multiply this thing that I forgot with z to the three, uh, you get a constant. And uh, so here you see different, two different values for this constant, depending on whether you take a dielectric medium or a semiconductor, which has some finite conductivity. The two differ in the value of epsilon at the frequency zero. So the dielectric has some value, epsilon, and the, uh, the, the conducting medium, if you plug in the formula for a conductor, sigma over omega, uh, that goes to infinity at zero frequency. So the, this, these two expressions have a different limit, depending on epsilon b, and I took here numbers where you see fairly nice the difference here between the two. And the question was, which model is right? And if you take the limit of a conductivity going slowly, slowly to zero, will you get this result because infinity stays infinity? Or do you get back to this dielectric where eventually uh, you ignore that there's some conductivity? So there was, there was a discussion also related to entropy and uh, the Nernst theorem and things like that. And so with this model here, this little CC and CL model, we find that this, these data here uh, cross over from a dielectric behavior at short distance to a conductor behavior at large distance. So we, we meet the two ends here. And uh, so according to this calculation, it is correct to put here epsilon equal to infinity. Uh, that would be the value that you have here. Uh, and, uh, but in between here, you get a kind of crossover between the two behaviors. Um, okay, I think that's all I wanted to say here. Um, so now we go to the Casimir between two plates. And uh, the motivation for doing this is what I call personally, uh, the, the concept did not stick, uh, uh, the thermal anomaly. That means how is temperature as a correction changing the Casimir interaction between two metals? And uh, normally we would expect that this uh, force becomes T dependent, temperature dependent, at distances larger than the thermal wavelengths, the mean wavelengths of the black body spectrum. So typically, depends on factors two pi, whether you include them or not in the micron range. Uh, but what has been observed by cal calculating the liftage formula uh, is that orderly corrections are visible in, at much smaller distances, factor 10 smaller, um, at the 10 to 20% level. And these corrections are also roughly of the same order as a difference between uh, the calculation with the Drude model, uh, this is the solid line here, and data by Ricardo. Ricardo and his group. So I learned that apparently these were the most precise, the most accurate force measurements uh, in the history of measurements. So, uh, so it's probably not quite old, but still not uh, not the wrong. Um, and uh, so the question is, uh, why is there this discrepancy here? So at the level of maybe 10, 20 percent or so, uh, because this is the standard theory that you would uh, believe: the Rudo model for a metal that has some conductivity, put it into Lipschitz formula and then uh, compared to the data, and there's a difference. So our question was here, if we play with boundary conditions, could we make a change for the theory, for the calculation of the theory? So here, who, who done it? Who's, who's the bad guy in this business here? Who could be responsible for this kind of discrepancy here? And my point is here, uh, okay, we can uh, classify these field fluctuations in terms of a k vector parallel to the surface because parallel, you have translation variance, you can go to Fourier, so there's a k. And the typical k vectors are limited uh, by the distance of the two plates. So one over z here is the typical scale of k. And uh, what uh, people have found, and I was not the first to observe this, is that these k vectors are much larger than the typical frequencies if you go to uh, those field modes that are thermally excited. So typical frequencies are then of the order of kdt. And so this inequality is uh, sending us into a kind of unknown realm. So we learned about spectroscopy to characterize materials. If you want to access this regime of K vectors, you can say wavelengths because it's spatial and frequencies, it's not at all accessible with ordinary spectroscopy. You would have to meet, have to work with evanescent waves, extreme near fields, which have very small scales and still are kind of slowly depending in, on frequency. So this is typically terahertz. And this wavelength here is typically submicron. So it does not fit at all in terms of electromagnetic waves. So you would have to find another way uh, of probing this experimentally. For the theorist, it means that you just don't care what you learn about electromagnetic waves. There's a possibility in this unknown realm of playing with short wavelengths, low frequency fields. And maybe boundary conditions are different from those what we are familiar with. 
So let's look how these boundary conditions could be changed. So this hydrodynamic model is based uh, on uh, uh, the idea that you can describe the electrons in the metal like a charged viscous fluid. So Bettina's poster gives you some applications on that. So I, I'm, I'm eager to know how you, how you did it. Yeah, so this is how, how, the way we, we did it. Um, so the viscosity of electrons can be found from this paper here. And um, uh, what we did is essentially writing down a Navier-Stokes equation, where, the, where there's a shear viscosity, eta. And um, uh, when, when you work out the uh, current density profile uh, inside the metal, so this is zero here, the surface, and then into the metal here, you find this kind of behavior here. It's a complex uh, field, so I plot the real and imaginary parts. And what you see here, the boundary condition that we took, that's an additional ABC, uh, is that the, the velocity of these electrons is zero at the boundary. That's a typical statement for hydrodynamics. It's called no slip. Yeah, a fluid is sticking to a boundary and is not moving there. Yeah. It's a kind of elegant solution to this ABC problem because we don't need an extra numerical parameter. It's just zero. There's no unit, nothing else. Velocity is zero at the boundary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we tried our best, yeah, and we just st st stick with that. Yeah. Uh, you could argue on which scale is this a valid description. So this L here is actually a kind of electronic mean free path, a few nanometers. So on that scale, you could have in a realistic metallic surface indeed roughness scattering, so that electrons are not moving as easily as elsewhere. Yeah, so that could be a justification to take this thing. Okay, so here, now in the bulk, you have this eta, which is the shear viscosity as a parameter. Our boundary condition is no slip at the surface. And what you get for the S polarized, the TE polarized reflectivity, now contains an extra term, the surface conductivity here. And you can explain it as by this ro 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 shaded area. There's a kind of current that is missing the dashed lines are the results of a local model. So you just take the local conductivity and you work out what the fields look like. And uh, this difference here is something like in the surface region, uh, the, 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 the conductivity is a bit smaller. And this is what you can see here. So the sheet current that is just uh, different at the boundary here. And uh, so here are the parameters. And now you want to know uh, what does this mean for the Casimir force? So we worked out a contribution that is related to um, the thermally excited TE polarized waves. And um, uh, so the uh, blue line is the local calculation and the orange line is with including the surface conductivity. If you see a reduction of this Casimir pressure, um, that could be, we, we were thinking a lot about some hand waving argument and I actually I forgot the arguments, so I cannot tell you why exactly that is reduced here. And uh, the, the data here that uh, were data points taken from Ricardo's paper here are also the difference between uh, the full expression calculated with the Druder model minus the experiment. So if you compare these two data, I was very nice pleased to see that the local uh, calculation of this class of electromagnetic modes, it's a subset of all the modes, is nicely fitting to this difference. So we kind of identified the bad guy again. So it's this thermally excited polarized uh, uh, electromagnetic waves in this S polarization. And if we could reduce their contribution uh, to uh, by changing the boundary conditions, then uh, this uh, difference here is becoming smaller. Yeah? So there was some hope that indeed you get better theory in, or that better agreement to the uh, experiment. So we had to bury uh, and uh, carry it to the tomb, this hope, because if we go through the full Matsubara summation, uh, actually, we do not find a ni such nice agreement here. What uh, Mandy found is uh, this 10 to 20 percent variability is also happening due to uh, electromagnetic data of simply dielectric functions. And so the different names here, Werner, Rakic, and so on, they, are di they give you results uh, taking different models of epsilon of, uh, of omega. And uh, so if you play with boundary conditions, all these Werner curves, they also shift a little bit. Uh, but overall, we find a model that is kind of uh, coincident with the data. Uh, so this kind of 10% offset now is, is gone, but you are left with a family of theories and you do not really know which, to, which one to choose. So I show you the data. 
the optical data. So this is just a compilation of uh, data sets that you could find on refractiveindex.info, for example. And these VANA data, uh, they appear here. Uh, it's a combination of some experiments and mainly electron loss spectroscopy. So actually, this is the very, very low energy part of that data set. It continues up to hundreds of electron volts in the high energies. So if you need really high energy data for gold, you can look there. But I have the feeling that here at low energies, there's something missing because the other data sets, Johnson and Christie and uh, Almond here, they are kind of lower uh, and uh, well, I'm not an experimentalist to, to tell you which data sets are of, of a better quality. Um, there's the scattering of, of data. It's just a pain. Okay, so let's uh, extend a little bit how these initial boundary conditions arise again in this, in this context. So if you have a problem uh, where your material response is what is called spatially local, um, then you have some exciton waves maybe or some other kind of things. So it, we can illustrate what happens here with this um, velocity waves, this hydrodynamic picture. So because you have then two equations, this is Maxwell, written in terms of the vector potential. This is the current density, density times velocity. And here's the uh, uh, Navier-Stokes equation. This is the electric field, if you think about it. This is some damping term for the velocity. And this is the typical term with the second spatial derivative and the um, uh, viscosity. So here's the expression for this viscosity. Uh, these two guys, uh, Conti and Vignale, they provided us with this number. We checked their calculations. So it's a very funny combination between Fermi velocity and the scattering time tau here that enters this uh, number here. And so when you have these two coupled equations and you want to find the transmitted waves, you have a vector potential that in, 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 in goes into the medium and you have this electron fluid that is moving around. And uh, if we had this example in terms of first order derivative Maxwell equations, uh, maybe it was Rudy Podgonik uh, who suggested that. Uh, if you go to the eigenvalues of this, op this matrix, you find eigenvalues that are characteristic for the uh, entering of these waves of certain eigen combinations. And actually you can identify them here with this uh, penetration constants, this decay constants, kappa one and kappa two. You find two of them because it's a two by two system. And so here are the typical ansatz that you would take for the magnetic field and the velocity of the electrons. And now this ABC is fixing the ratio between these two amplitudes, V1 and V2. Because you just impose at zero, it's zero, Z equals zero, and that fixes to the ratio here. Um, but you could take also a different conditions in the terms of, in the context of um, excitons. People were trying with different boundary conditions related to uh, how you continue across the vacuum side, your fields, and so on. Um, so there's a whole zoology of uh, this kind of ABC. Um, so this paper by Henneberger, I mentioned it. Uh, there were comments immediately uh, one year later uh, on this paper. So there has been some discussion whether he got it right. And uh, something that I would like to remind is um, these ABCs uh, kind of hide that a surface is more than bulk. You need more than just a number or say a condition like zero to continue what you know from the bulk to the interface. Because an interface has its own response. It's a genuine object with some proper dynamics. And um, uh, so this is somewhat sometimes hidden in this idea that you just need boundary conditions. Sometimes the surface on its own has its own dynamics and you need additional fields, for example, to take that into account. Okay. So I have uh, about uh, maybe seven minutes to talk about entanglement. So as a definition, this is an attempt to quantify uh, correlations. And of course, we know that correlations can be quantum correlations, but there are also classical correlations, of course. And uh, entanglement is tr uh, rising to the problem, can we make a difference? Take apart what is classical and identify what is a genuine quantum correlation. Uh, that cannot be explained with classical uh, terms. And uh, that's one aspect of this concept. And the other one is you need to, to talk about a system that has two parts, A and B, because you want to make a statement like A and B are entangled by something. And this number, something usually measured in entanglement bits, tells you how much you are entangled. If it's zero, they're not entangled. They could be classically correlated. And if it's five or so, then you uh, can use it for 
teleporting five bits to somebody else in terms of quantum information. Um, okay, so here's a very simple example. Everybody knows here from Casimir Porter van der Waals that this could be the dipole dipole interaction between two atoms, A and B, dipole operators. If you take matrix elements of this operator between typical states here, a two level atom, G, G, and if you take two of them, you get four levels. So this V here connects uh, these two states extreme on the energy side and, so, and also these two here. And if you diagonalize then uh, this Hamiltonian, you find eigenstates that are linear combinations here of the two middle states. They are split by the interaction. That's a way to measure it. And also this ground state here is a little bit split down. Uh, but then this is the ratio V over E that makes this uh, shift much, much smaller. So here's a typical eigenstate, the linear combination of G and E. This state is entangled. It's not the tensor product. Yeah, and so we could ask you, how much is the, are these two atoms now entangled if you, they happen to be in this ground state, uh, including the interaction? And uh, if you do this, uh, this is the recipe you have to uh, apply. So imagine that you are in a pure state, Psi, of the, of the bipartite system, and uh, you uh, trace out one of the two partners, let's say A or B. Then you get uh, an object that is some density matrix, which is not a pure state, and you can compute its von Neumann entropy. Okay? You get the same result either with atom A or atom B, because it's a pure state you start with, and this entropy is a quantitative measure of the entanglement between the two. So when you work out here, the partial trace uh, of about uh, for atom B gives you a projector on the ground state or on the excited state. The square of this amplitude here appears as a prefactor, and you can read this as the uh, probability one over Z of this state, and the excited state has the smaller probability. The entanglement is the entropy of this thing. You can simplify it a bit, and if you plot it versus the coupling V over E, you get this kind of curves. So the blue one is the entanglement, and the energy shift also increases. For sure, at small e v, this one is quadratic. For the entanglement, I'm not completely sure because of its logarithm. If you plot one against the other, you see a little bit curvature, so probably there's some logarithmic behavior at small v over e here. So this is the entanglement in terms of energy shift. So the two are monotonously related. If, you, if the two atoms are shifted due to van der Waals, they're also entangled. So you could ask uh, this, uh, uh, the, these questions here in, from a quantum state perspective. So we can imagine atom A and B that they are spatially separated. So you could address atom A individually and ask what are your observables, what is your reduced state density matrix, um, because this is what this trace B is telling us. If you measure just atom A, what kind of uh, predictions can we make from quantum mechanics? Um, if we ask a bit further, uh, could we also uh, try to say how much atom A is entangled with a photon field around it? So it's a kind of virtual cloud of photons that is surrounding any charged or polarizable object. Uh, it's difficult, more difficult to, think, to, tear, to tear them apart. Could you take out these virtual photons and observe them separately? Probably not. And uh, maybe the same is also applying for these atoms A and B that are correlated by some virtual interactions, uh, virtual photons, which is hidden in these electrostatics. So I have the feeling that this concept is very popular. You can get of millions of any uh, currency unit if you apply for quantum information uh, projects. Uh, but uh, in our community, it's just the kind of rewriting of what you know about correlations and quantum states and um, quantum fields. Okay, so. Uh, uh, Ten years ago, Israel Klisch uh, worked out a slightly different viewpoint on fluctuations, and his approach was a bit closer to the Casimir setting, so I'll try to review it here. So this is the field theory that he was setting up. Phi is a field, and Psi are uh, fields that describe the excitations of these two bodies, A and B. They are coupled by some usual bilinear thing, so this is worked out in such a way that you can essentially diagonalize this exactly and uh, work out everything. So the ground state of the whole system is probably a, a, a product of all k vectors uh, of these states that we saw before for the two atoms. So atom body A in the ground state and the vacuum field. You have one photon here and the either body A excited or the other one and other terms here. And so what Israel found is that if you take the limit of the uh, a large distance of these two objects, you can ask for the, um, the entropy 
of this object here. So it would, could be the entropy of the fields taking out the bodies, or the other way around. If they both are in the pure state, the answer is the same. And so there's a constant term plus a thing, term that depends on the distance here. And here the dimension uh, peeps in, and uh, I don't really understand how uh, this could be interpreted. I was checking Clear's paper and was asking myself, is this now an entropy per unit area? As we know for Casimir, that's the relevant one. Uh, I don't really know. You, maybe you want, you're interested, you can check it out. Um, here's a one paper that uh, I myself wrote on entanglement uh, b between two oscillators. Yeah, so these things are not resistors, they are springs. Uh, so X and Y are coupled with a spring and then coupled to the heat bars. So it's a, also a non-equilibrium problem. And the main point I want to make here is um, this is a calculation of entanglement measurements um, or measures. They are related to EPR, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen correlations um, as a function of the coupling between the two oscillators here. Uh, they can be worked out also at finite temperature if your state is not a pure state. And so we see that this is the kind of critical line for some coupling here. You drop below this line, the state is entangled. And here is this entropy, Alak Israel Klich, calculated for the same problem. Now, uh, the total entropy, as taught here, is positive because you are not in a pure state, but it differs from the sum of the two entropies of the two subsystems. So the dashed line here, S1 plus S2. And so this difference is a measure of entropic correlations, uh, correlation entropy. And so you could try to identify now here, these two are correlated. But this position here is a kind of gradual transition, and here it does not coincide with the point where entanglement appears. So these two ways of characterizing the thing are not really quantitatively in agreement. Okay, I think I'm finished. So boundary conditions are a way to compute refractivities, and eventually they determine its dispersion forces like Casimir. Sometimes you really need more details about the surface to get out uh, from to, to get these reflectivities. There are people who would like to do solid spectro spectroscopy. For them, it's a pain in the ass because they want to see the bulk, not the surface. But for us, maybe it's an interesting playground uh, to get better agreement with Casimir measurements. Um, and in terms of entanglement, uh, it's an alternative viewpoint, very fashionable on correlated quantum fluctuations. Casimir interactions may be a way to quantitatively measure entanglement and, and uh, give it a number in terms of a force. Uh, that's interesting. And here is a gray box here is a, is a debate point. So can we in, introduce entanglement between two objects um, via an interaction that is itself classical? And that's a question that has been raised here by uh, Vlako Vidral and uh, other people. And uh, uh, Bailak Hu, who many people here know, he made a critical comment on these proposals by saying, hey, look at that. If you take two atoms, and just take uh, a scalar potential of uh, virtual scalar photons yeah, that interact the two that will for sure entangle the two atoms. We, we did the little calculation here. But this does not mean that photons exist. It just means that there's a Coulomb interaction. Photons are something different. Transverse excitations of whatever you want to call them. And in, in terms of gravity, it's the same problem. Yeah, Bailog Hu tells us, you know, there's a Newtonian limit of gravity that you get out of these metric equations, and they, they, they don't have really to do with gravitons. And that was the point. Yeah, so this uh, Vladko Vila tried to show if we generate entanglement, it's a proof that gravitons exist. So that discussion is interesting, but it's probably still open. Thank you. Okay, I see many questions. <laughs> Thank you, Karsten. Uh, I have a question about the, the idea of entanglement. Mm -hmm. What happens if you have another slab? Mm -hmm. Because if you try to, to figure out the, the Casimir interaction via the entanglement, mm -hmm. you have the, the, the theorem about the entanglement monogamy. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you, you have two plates, okay, it's okay. But mm -hmm. if you have a third one, what happens with the, the monogamy? Um, so probably one has to try to formulate it in the correct way. So Israel Klich, he had two plates in his model. Yes. So you could ask, is this entanglement between plate A and the field or plate B and the field? And so there are three partners there. 
Um, so he probably he, he sorted it out by saying, let's uh, forget about the field and ask about how is, at, how is body A and B then entangled indirectly via the field. So then it, it's again monogamous because you have two partners. But I don't know in the more general sense. Hi, Karsten. I have a question about your boundary conditions problem. Mm -hmm. You're introducing essentially uh, the surface, the role of the surface of a metal or mm -hmm. whatever three-dimensional yeah. uh, substrate you have as a separate entity. Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite sure if that is, um, if, if, you know, if that makes sense, at least to me, mm -hmm. uh, because you can't really separate uh, the role of the surface from the rest of the bulk of the material, at least mm -hmm. not to, to, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. So what's the physical meaning of that kind of separation? From one mm -hmm. hand, it also implies that somehow you have um, dispersion mm -hmm. explicitly introduced in the problem, mm -hmm. uh, which um, I don't know if the surface can be thought of separately from the bulk, Mm -hmm. And also the, the paper you showed by Giovanni Vinali, mm -hmm. as far as I understand that um, maybe the origin of this kind of uh, behavior is because of nonlinear phenomena beyond mm -hmm. the linear response mm -hmm. regime. So can you elaborate a little bit more um, on the role of the surface and how yeah, so, you think about it? Yeah, yeah, so probably I just want to say that the conditions near the surface are different than from the bug. And people who are no surface physics, they know that. So there's a reconstruction of the crystal structure at the surface. So the crystalline structure of, if you would ask for a band structure of electrons, you would find a different result in the surface region. Because the, the coordination numbers are different. So the, 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 the mechanical composition of your atoms in, in the few layers is different. So this is a way of, okay, imagine you do not want to resolve these scales. Let's try to make a little model where this subsurface region is behaving in a different way. That's it. Uh, Carsten, a very nice talk. Uh, I was doing some reading and, uh, on this uh, hydrodynamics mm -hmm. versus uh, uh, Feynman has approach mm -hmm. and deal with the photo surface photoelectric effect, right? So, mm -hmm. So the, the hydrodynamics is sort of classical treating electrons mm -hmm. and uh, water cone was built in, in the 70s. They calculated the electrons spill over mm -hmm. out of the surface. Mm -hmm. So basically they're about one or two Armstrong level yeah. uh, spill over out of the surface. And mm -hmm. then uh, 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 see a more rigorous approach mm -hmm. uh, was uh, by Fieberman. Mm -hmm. uh, the couple, the uh, they did the GL model mm -hmm. of the surface with the uh, with the uh, classical electrodynamics mm -hmm. along local, mm -hmm. uh, and they introduced the Feynman parameter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, have you looked into the difference if you take the Feynman parameter uh, as a boundary kind of modified? And uh, Maren Soyacek at MIT had a generalized mm -hmm. sort of a boundary condition mm -hmm. for the scenario. I wonder whether you looked into that. Or not. Um, so I did not work anything quantitatively in that context. I, I know that the Feynman concept, you could, uh, just in the spirit that I try to, 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 to convey here, it, they are an exact example of some additional boundary condition with some genuine surface response. This surface charge yeah. centroid yeah. Uh, is a way to say how does the electron density behave differently right. in this region. Um, it may be a question of length scales. So these few micro, few angstroms of electron spill out, they play a role indeed for surface plasmons. Um, what I was trying to do here is a bit more coarser in length scale. So this length L5 nanometers is much larger than that. Right, I, mm -hmm. I guess to say my sort of reading, the impression I had, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't write mm -hmm. anything there. The impression I had is that this uh, is a better because of the spillover, it's a more quantum approach mm -hmm. of the entire surface region mm -hmm. uh, rather than more classical hydrodynamic approach. Mm -hmm. So I'd be curious. I, 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 yeah, uh, yeah. I, I guess I, mm -hmm. my, my question is uh, on the entanglement. Mm -hmm. So looking into your entropy difference between isolated system yeah. and uh, uh, now the next one, uh, you've got an entropy, no, the next, next go order. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, um, what does it mean? Does it mean when there is entanglement, there is entropy generation because of the difference from isolated one? 
Um, so in this very simple example that you have a pure state for the entire system and you look at just one part of it, uh, indeed you could say that, uh, this partial state has more entropy than the entire state because you're missing the correlations with the other part. So, so you, you generate entropy by ignorance, this typical statistical physics thing. Thank you, Kirsten, for the mini concert uh, and also for the talk. Uh, no, uh, it was just a comment for uh, regarding the, 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 the remark from Olivia. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in your correction of the dielectric response, you consider a, a charge on the surface, but uh, practically you should you should observe an oscillation uh, like uh, mm -hmm. like the Friedel oscillation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This could be probably uh, taken into account here yeah, also to y yes. properly... Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, it's a question of length scales. I would guess that these Friedel oscillations happen on a shorter scale. Yeah. Uh, and so what we see here is, is, is the kind of very far away. So in the surface region, there's some oscillations and then further out. Um, it, it was just to say, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not uh, saying that yeah. it's wrong, or it's just to say that there is not a sharp transition between the surface Mm -hmm. and the, the bulk, you yeah. have a smooth transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, short scale, but a yeah. smooth transition. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. So, this sharp value of z equals zero yeah. is only, makes only sense on, on, the, on the length scale that we are considering here, which is the cos one. Mm -hmm. Uh, Karsten, I, I just want to uh, make sure I understood what you said. So in the entanglement generation, mm -hmm. uh, am I understanding correctly you are saying that if I take two atoms, both of them initially in the ground state, mm -hmm. and I bring it to a surface, mm -hmm. and then there would be an excited, com excited state components in each of these atoms? Um, well, they are as virtual as difficult to describe as any other Van der Waals interaction or dispersion interaction. So um, um, you could say, is, are these two excited atoms here? Are they, can you measure them? Can you, can you ec extract this part here uh, of the entire two body state and see how they are excited? I, I don't think so. This is kind of virtual way of putting the two together in the genuine quantum sense to take into account the interaction. Um, so it would be different if you take uh, the superpositions here, because here you could say, is the excitations on one or the other atom? Um, so uh, playing with these uh, uh, entangled states is physically a bit more closer to what you can do than trying to tear apart uh, what is happening here. Um, so this is what I would say. Uh, then maybe let me ask a, uh, a related but hopefully simpler question. Mm -hmm. If I take one atom yep. initially in the ground state mm -hmm. and then I just uh, gradually move towards the surface, yep. uh, would I be able to excite the atom? Uh, that's a dynamical Casimir problem? No, 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 very, very Well, slow. in a sense, yes, if you would move it around very fast. No, no, very slow, very, very slow. Very slow, no, you won't. No, right, okay, yeah, all right. Okay. Oh. Yeah, two. Oh, okay. Yeah, two. okay, so uh, I get your argument that the surface is modified. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the optical response of the surface could be modified. Mm -hmm. My question is, uh, should not this be captured in the tabulated data as well? Because they're doing, they're shooting photons and looking at the reflectivity of the photons, right? So it should be captured, you expect. Mm -hmm. This should be, because it should be averaged, uh, captured out on average, right, the surface response. And secondly, if you're gonna say it's not captured, then can you predict a correction to the optical data? Or what fraction of the correction it is? Do you, do you follow my, what I'm saying? Yeah, I think I get it. Um, so indeed, if you go to this database, refractive index, where I took these numbers from, you see this is gold, this is sputtered gold, and this is something else gold. Yeah, so it's different preparation, conditions of a film, and uh, so what you do in experiment is to prepare your film and via ellipsometry, try to model what you measure, which is the kind of reflectivity uh, in the two polarizations, 
uh, in terms of a bulk dielectric function, the most compact way of representing these data. So perhaps, well, it's, it's immediately clear that if these data differ, because the data sets you find they are different, but then the, uh, probably also the, the interface conditions and the whole preparation makes a difference. But it's not completely obvious how to make it, how to translate this in, a, in, a more, in an efficient way into some, just one additional parameter. I don't know. Yeah, so these kind of, these kind of differences cannot account for the measurement, different, difference between measurement and theory. Very small differences in the optical data. So you have to be, your surface model has to predict a larger difference than we see here in the tablet mm -hmm. data, right? So, and you are seeing this from your prediction, uh, a larger difference than you see in the optical data here? Uh, so if you look at the scattering or the variance between yeah. these curves, it's comparable. It's comparable. It's comparable. Okay, but it depends so on the parameters this is the last you question. Yeah. Uh, just a very short comment, uh, uh, Carsten. Uh, the non-additivity of the entropies mm -hmm. is typical of the so-called uh, strong coupling regime. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, when the coupling is, uh, mm -hmm. is, is, is weak, and then the system is addi perfectly additive, mm -hmm. and this is the regime with a classical thermodynamic hole. Mm -hmm. But if you go to a, a for example, you, you consider a very small system mm -hmm. uh, in contact with a bath, mm -hmm. and the interactions are very strong, neither the energy nor the entropy are additive. Okay. And this mm -hmm. gives rise to a different thermodynamics. Mm -hmm. For example, mm -hmm. you could have situations in which the temperature of the system is different from the temperature of the bath. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So you see it here. Uh, so this difference here is, a, is an indication of what you could call strong coupling. And indeed the coupling here is comparable in, this is two frequencies ratio, is really towards this strong coupling regime. Okay, we thank Karsten again. And there is a break now and we go back at four.